Uh, this is uh, the third and final lecture uh, by Dr. Uh, Brueggemann, and so without further ado, I would uh, invite you to welcome back Dr. Walter Brueggemann. Thank you. Well, when you do a series of this many lectures, you have two anxieties about whether you run out of material and whether you run out of people. So uh, we're going we're gonna to finish about even, I think, and uh, I thank you for uh, being here one more time. And I'm uh, so grateful to uh, Don, uh, Bob, who has been such a, a gracious host to me, and uh, I'm uh, so delighted to have uh, met a number of you. and. Uh, and to get to be with you in this wonderful place. I uh, haven't been to many churches where you get that kind of wonderful music before you worship. And, uh, I think if I could belong to this parish, I probably would increase my pledge for that. <laughs> uh, 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 I'm going to talk about uh, new orientation, about the astonishing gift that people in disorientation do move to new orientation in ways that we do not understand, and every time it's a gift. I would think it's an impossibility. When John the Baptist in Luke 7 was arrested he sent word to Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus sent word back saying, I don't know whether I'm the Christ, because they haven't written the creeds yet. <laughs> but go tell John that everywhere I go, new orientation happens. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised and the poor rejoice. So the gospel is about the move to new orientation, and we do not know how it happens, so if you hang out in a church, an old man dies, and his wife is bereft, and she goes underground for a while, and three years later, she shows up beaming with her new partner. And nobody knows how she got there. She can still remember him, but that's over now, and this is Fred. Meet Fred. So I want to talk about uh, four uh, maneuvers in the book of Psalms about new orientation. And what I want to say is that while the actual experience of new orientation happens now and then and here and there in ways that we do not understand, the worshiping community keeps declaring new orientation regularly so that you can latch on to it when you're ready. So we keep announcing every Sunday that your sins are forgiven, even though you may not be at that place yet. We keep announcing the good news, and you can take it when you're ready. So the first point of four that I want to make is that the Psalms evidence the liturgical performance of new orientation. There are six psalms that explicitly refer to Yahweh as the new king. These are called enthronement psalms. They imagine the enthroning of Yahweh. Uh, the ones that will be easy for you to remember are Psalms 93, 96, 97, 98, and 99. They all uh, refer to that, and I'm going to talk about Psalm 96. You want to take a look at it? It starts out, sing to the Lord a new song. 
that probably means that for the great day of enthronement, they had commissioned a new anthem. So here's a new song for the newness of God. That particular line is precious to me because when I started teaching in theological college, I went back to my alma mater and all my new colleagues had been my teachers. So when I had to lead chapel the first time, I was very nervous. And I used this psalm as a call to worship and I solemnly said, Song to the Lord, a new sing. That's what I said. So it's a summons to celebrate. Sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, bless His name, tell His salvation, declare His glory. Sing, 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 bless, tell, declare. Because, verse 4, because Yahweh is great. Verse 5, because the gods of the peoples, and probably the word should be translated, are rags. They are, they are worthless. And then there's another summons in verse 7, ascribe to Yahweh, ascribe to Yahweh, ascribe to Yahweh, bring an offering, come, worship, tremble. And then when you get to verse 10, you got it. Verse 10, announce among the nations. They imagined that the liturgy in Jerusalem was world-making. So the gospel comes from Jerusalem, and the good news is that Yahweh is king. The presumption of three hours of darkness on Friday is that God's sovereignty has failed and chaos reigns. But 96.10 says Yahweh is back in town, back on the throne. So Yahweh is king, could be translated, Yahweh has just become king. So the making of Yahweh as the king, which is the new orientation, is a liturgical act. The church does not sing that Christ the Lord is risen in 33 AD. The church sings on Easter, Christ the Lord is risen today in this liturgical performance. And at Christmas time, we say, joy to the world, the Lord has come, the Lord has come here now in this Christmas pageant. So the great pageants of new orientation, Christmas, Easter, claim to affect something that was not in effect until we do it liturgically, and then it happens. So the community of God gathers to celebrate the news that new power is on the throne and new purpose is infused in the world and there is cause for celebration and joy and dancing and revelry. And when the word gets out about this new liturgical reality, everybody's happy. The heavens are glad, the earth is glad, the sea is glad, the fields are glad, the trees are glad, the forest is glad. They're all glad because the old abuses are going to stop. The old abuses of the ocean with chemical deposits is going to stop. So the sea roars its approval. And deforestation is going to stop so the trees clap their hands and the forests dance because the world is brought to new creation. That's what they did liturgically. And the sign-off is that the new regime will be, verse 10, firm so that it won't be destabilized, won't be disoriented. And in verse 13, the new regime will be full of righteousness and fidelity. The NRSV translates truth. It probably ought to be translated reliability. This is a world that you can count on 
and you can lean back into it. It's an extraordinary gift. Now I want to tell you about a scholarly hypothesis from a scholar named Sigmund Movinkel. He is the second most important psalm scholar in the modern era. He is a Norwegian and he died in about 1970, but when he was a young scholar in 1924, he wrote six little pamphlets on the Psalms in the Old Testament. They've been translated into German, they've never been translated into English. But the second little pamphlet, probably 60 pages, had a hypothesis that every year in the Jerusalem temple, they had a liturgy at the new year in which they staged a dramatic performance of a contest among the gods and all the gods performed something and then the angels in heaven voted to see who the god would be for the new year and every year Yahweh won. So Yahweh became king for another year. And Movinkel has worked that out with uh, great detail and great nuance. Now I'll tell you two things about the, about the hypothesis. First of all, almost no scholar accepts the hypothesis. It's kind of too uh, daring. But secondly, almost every scholar operates with it <laughs> under the table. So there is a huge assumption among scholars, which doesn't make it true, that something happened every year in the festival of the new year in the Jerusalem temple that Yahweh was newly acclaimed to be the God of Shalom and everybody rallied in joy and confidence that you had a sense that the world was safe again. Now whether you would accept that hypothesis or not, or whether you would accept that a liturgical performance could achieve that, it seems to me that's a very good way to understand new orientation that is liturgically enacted, that makes theological claims that the power of death and the power of chaos and the power of injustice have all been defeated. I want to show you one other psalm that uh, might um, serve that hypothesis if you look at Psalm 29. Psalm 29 uh, is a, a thought to be a very old psalm that was probably uh, borrowed from the Canaanites. So we have fragments of a text from the Canaanites that says, uh, look at the first verse, ascribe to Baal ascribed to Baal, ascribed to Baal, and they simply took it over and changed the name and made it Yahweh. Now hold that and look back at Psalm 96. If you look at Psalm 96, verse 7, ascribed to Yahweh, ascribed to Yahweh, ascribed to Yahweh. Now hold that and look back at 29, ascribed to Yahweh, Ascribe to Yahweh, ascribe to Yahweh. So what most scholars think is that Psalm 29 is very old and Psalm 96 is quoting Psalm 29. It's a, it's a liturgical piece so you could use it in a lot of contexts. But look at the first line, the, the, the Psalm 29 says, ascribe to Yahweh heavenly beings and you have a footnote that says sons of God. These are, these are angels so this this is a, a liturgical imagination that this psalm is being performed in heaven among the gods. But then look back at 96.7 where they've changed it, ascribed to Yahweh, O families of the peoples. Now what I imagine, now I'm going to talk about 29, what I imagine is, I don't know whether this happens in Canada, but in the United States when you have a local election, what you'll get is a pickup truck and it has a microphone on the back of it 
and uh, you drive through the neighborhood saying the candidate's name. So vote for Harper, vote for Harper. So imagine a pickup truck going through the neighborhood. Vote for Yahweh, vote for Yahweh, vote for Yahweh, tremble before Yahweh, worship Yahweh, and not the other competing gods. So it's a bid in 29 to get the angels to vote for Yahweh, and in 46 it's a bid to get the families of the nations to vote for Yahweh. Now, my best analogy for Psalm 29 uh, uh, have any of you ever seen the, the uh, U.S. Miss America contest? No, nobody watches it anymore, but you know how it used to be. And uh, the way they, they were, there was a liturgy to pick out the most beautiful young woman. And, and uh, the guy that was the MC in the, in the great days was Burt Parks. And he would interview each candidate after they got it down to six or something. And he would ask uh, each one... Uh, and what are you going to do? You, they all had to do a performance. And every one of them said, um, well, I'm going to tap dance Gershwin. That's what they all did. And then I'm going to work for world peace, he said. And then I'm going to open shopping malls next year. That's what you had to do. You, you saw where uh, Donald Trump has just recently dethroned Miss California because she wasn't opening enough shopping malls. So imagine after verse 2, the master of ceremony says to Yahweh, who's a candidate, uh, and what are you going to do for us? And Yahweh doesn't tap dance Gershwin, but uh, Yahweh says, I am a storm god, and I am going to perform a hell of a storm. So verses 3 through 9, if you take that hypothesis, Describe Yahweh's performance of a storm. The voice of Yahweh is over the waters, and you remember in that kind of usage, the waters are the, are the surging powers of chaos that are all around the earth. And the, the phrase, the mighty waters, is a technical phrase, meaning the, the deep waters of death. The voice of Yahweh is powerful, the voice of Yahweh is full of majesty. The voice of Yahweh breaks cedar trees. He's describing a hurricane or something like that. And if you've ever seen a young calf, you know that a really newborn calf can hardly stand up. They're so unstable, they can hardly stand up to nurse. So he makes these great cedar trees of Lebanon like a newborn calf, like a young wild ox. And then verse 7 describes the lightning and the sweep of the storm down into the desert that stirs up the sand in verse 8. The voice of Yahweh twists mighty oak trees and strips the forest bare. This is a powerful force of the Creator God. And then the judges vote. 10, 10, 10, 10, <laughs> ten 2, that's a Canaanite judge. Ten. <laughs> All say wow. That's what they do on American Idol, right? All say wow. Well, the text says they all say glory. They all say this is the winner. And those of you that have seen Miss America, then you know that when she's named... Then she gets her crown, and then she walks down the ramp, and she gets her flowers, and, her, and then she cries. She always cries. She's so deeply moved about opening shopping malls. <laughs> and then she sits on her throne. So verse 10 says, Yahweh is now enthroned on the flood which we would think would be a pretty unstable place to put a throne except you remember that Jesus stilled the storm he just said shut up 
And all the waves fell back in obedience because they recognized his voice. He is, he is the creator God. So the creator God can still the chaos can overcome the disorientation. And all is well and all manner of thing shall be well. And then the last thing is that the newly elected king on the throne announces a program of peace and prosperity. That's what they always announce. Peace and prosperity for the next year. So the last word is to bless the people with peace. Now here's a, a little riddle for you. What hymn in the New Testament do you know that begins as this song begins in glory, glory to Yahweh, and ends in peace? Say it. The angels of Bethlehem. The angels of Bethlehem say, Glory to Yahweh on the highest and peace to you guys on earth, persons of goodwill. So if you like Movenkel's hypothesis, you don't have to vote on it, you can entertain the thought that what's going on at Bethlehem is that the angels are conducting an enthronement ceremony and they are celebrating the fact that at Bethlehem the new king has been born who deserves glory and who will bring peace on earth to men of goodwill. Men, generic. Now that's a big leap from Psalm 29 to Bethlehem, but it permits the thought that when the church celebrates Christmas and celebrates Easter, what the church is doing is conducting enthronement ceremonies about the newly born king, joy to the world, the Lord is come here now. And when the priest says Christ is risen and the congregation says Christ is risen indeed, it is the celebration of a new governance in heaven and on earth. So whether you accept Movenkel's hypothesis or not, I want to suggest to you that the great liturgic festivals of the church are rooted in these old liturgies that celebrate the kingship of God who turns out to be stronger than the power of chaos and more purposeful than all of our disorientations. So I entertain the thought that people in a variety of disorientations come to church to participate in the liturgy to see whether in this dramatic liturgical performance the world can be made new. So when they go out of church people never say that. People don't say uh, thank you for conducting an enthronement ceremony, thank you for making the world new. But in less or maybe more eloquent ways than that, people do say after church, I can go on again, or I had a glimpse that there are resources available in my life that I didn't know about until they were put on offer in this festival. So I believe it's a nice connection between what must have been some kind of ancient liturgy and the liturgy that still goes on because our experience from Eucharist to Eucharist is that the powers of chaos do creep up on us again and get a grip on us 
and we come back to the festival to be renewed and restored and forgiven and healed and sent on our way rejoicing. So that's the first of these four things that I want to say. The second thing is that I want to talk about the pastoral mediation of new orientation. I want you to look back at Psalm 22 just for an instant. Uh, you can remember I showed you that between verse 21a and verse 21b something happened that turned the rhetoric to uh, praise and we looked at Psalm 113 something happened between verses 4 and 5. So it's worth asking about that something. Here's a hypothesis that many scholars follow which doesn't make it true. The hypothesis is that between 21a and 21b or between verse 4 and verse 5 or any psalm where the turn is, some trusted authorized leader pronounced a salvation oracle. And the salvation oracle, if it's trusted, turns out to be totally transformative. So I want to show you some salvation oracles. This is a hypothesis. If you look at Isaiah 41, beginning at verse 8, and you know that this part of Isaiah is addressed to Israelites in exile. 41.8, you Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took, you whom I called, to you whom I said, you are my servant, I have chosen you. And not, that's all address. I mean you. Now look at the next line, verse 10. Do not fear. That's the salvation oracle. Do not fear because I am with you. I have come to be with you in the disorientation. Parallelism, do not be afraid for I am your God, I will strengthen, I will help, I will uphold. Verse 13, do not fear, I will help you. Now remember that in Psalm 22, in verse 9, wasn't it, or 10, 10, the first petition was, do not be far from me. On the hypothesis, the answer is, do not fear, I am right here with you, I have come to answer your petition, and the drama of faith is in the conviction that when God comes to be in the disorientation, the disorientation is already transformed and we are on our way to new orientation. Now look at verse 14. Do not fear, worm. Do not fear, insect, or some translations, maggot. Hold that. And look back at Psalm 22. This is the complaint, verse 6, 22, 6, I am a worm. Do not fear, worm. Now I have to tell you something that strikes me about this verse. I don't know whether you, I assume theological students in Canada do clinical pastoral education. Clinical pastoral education, when you're in training, you have, to, you have to go, for example, into a hospital room and you have to conduct this interview with a sick person and you have to write it all down, what they said and what you said and so on, and then your supervisor reviews it. And everybody, when they begin, they, they go into this hospital room and they want to be reassuring and nice and well-liked. So the person in the sick room says, you know, I feel like a worm. And you respond, oh, I don't think you're a worm. 
I think you're going to be all right. And then your supervisor writes on your verbatim, you flinched, you couldn't stay with the pain, you tried to change the subject. So it occurs to me that Isaiah, he had clinical pastoral education. He knew not to do that. So when Israel says, I'm a worm, Isaiah doesn't say, I don't think you're a worm. He says, yeah, I can see you're a worm. But I got good news for you, worm. Do not be a frightened worm, because I will help you. So I want to suggest that at the center, this is a hypothesis, at the center of the Psalter and at the center of the experience of disorientation is the evangelical announcement that God has answered prayer, that God has come to be in the disorientation and therefore the petitioner need no longer vex about the disorientation because everything is on its way to newness. Uh, in uh, chapter 44, there's one other that I uh, want to mention, and that's in uh, 44, 8. Do not fear, do not be afraid. And then what's interesting about this, the, 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 the two lines down, it says, you are my witnesses. Don't be afraid, go on and be a witness. Go on and name my name in the Babylonian Empire and let them know about the new king of the world. So I tried to think about where would you get frightened witnesses? And I could think of two cases. You might think of some others. I could think of a corporate whistleblower that goes to court to testify against the corporation that's been cheating or abusing or something. And at the last minute, the witness tells his lawyer, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'll lose my pension and they might kill me because corporations pay hardball. And then the lawyer has to say, do not fear, go be a witness. The other case that I could think of is a woman that's been raped and they're bringing the rapist to trial and she has to tell the story of abuse and at the last minute she tells her lawyer, I can't do that. I, I don't want to I don't want to talk about that in public. And the lawyer says, you have to do that. We'll never get him if you don't tell your story in public to the court. So do not fear, do not fear. The witnesses in the book of Isaiah are to announce that God has heard their prayers, their laments, their complaints, and God has come to be with them and has changed everything with do not fear, but it's really scary in the Babylonian Empire to bear witness to Yahweh, who is a God that the Babylonian Empire has tried to get rid of. I thought of one other place for do not fear. I've been doing a scientific survey all kinds of parents who never heard the phrase Salvation Oracle do Salvation Oracles when a child in the night has a nightmare. And you hear the kid and you go into the kid's bedroom and you say, you say, don't be afraid, I'm right here. You say, do not fear, <laughs> I am with you. And the amazing thing about the parent doing that, disrupting the nightmare, is you take the kid to the bathroom and you give the kid a drink of water and the kid rolls over and goes to sleep and you don't even know what the nightmare was. You don't even know what the nightmare was. What you do know is that your trustworthy intervention has changed the world and has brought the nightmare of disorientation to an abrupt end. Now, the reason I 
draw that analog is to suggest to you the credibility and the transformative power of a salvation oracle when it is announced to people who believe in you, who say, I have come to be here with you in your disorientation. And that's a, that's a huge transformative moment. I suspect that in psychotherapy, with all kinds of theories of personality, Freudian and Jungian or whatever, that the real force of psychotherapy is telling the lament to somebody you trust and they look back at you affirmatively and saying, I'm right here, and you don't have to be haunted by that. I can remember in my long years of psychotherapy, I can remember the day when my pastor therapist said to me, you have a lot of pain, don't you? I can remember the day of the utterance because it changed everything. It changed everything because I was not alone in my disorientation. So this seems to me to be a succinct articulation of the gospel that God comes in answer to petition and complaint and being there makes all things new and then it occurs to me that it is best that a local congregation is an embodied salvation oracle that goes around the community to places of disorientation to be there in powerful ways that say do not fear we are with you. It is a statement of transformative solidarity. And uh, if you scan the gospel stories, and particularly the gospel of Luke, I think I found six times in which either Jesus or the angels say, fear not. It's uh, fear not to Elizabeth, it's fear not to Mary, it's fear not to the disciples, it's fear not to the mother of the dead girl, it's fear not, fear not, it's fear not the angel at the Easter tomb, so that you can say that according to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel narrative is saturated with God's announcement that transforms the chaos and the disorientation of the world. So that's my second point. My third point is that the reception of newness from God characteristically entails gratitude expressed materially, that is, a thank offering. Now, I don't know whether Canadians ever did thank offerings like this, but I can remember as a child you had a thank offering box that stayed on the kitchen table and you put two pennies in every day, a child did. And I thought, I think now, boy, that was really pretty anemic thanks two cents a day, put my two cents worth in, like that. So the Psalms evidence thanks, but thanks is never simply verbal, but it is also material. So I want to show you some texts on that. First of all, 107 is such a marvelous Psalm of thanks. I don't know that it's a psalm that we use a lot. The first three verses are a kind of introduction. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, because Yahweh is good and faithful and does all this neat stuff. Then what follows are four stylized episodes 
of being in disorientation and moving to new orientation. The first episode in verse 4 is that some wandered in desert places hungry and thirsty and they fainted and then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble and then notice the way verse 6 works there's no pause there's simply a comma and of course you have no commas in Hebrew so you can even strike out the comma if you want to immediately immediately they cried he delivered it worked that quickly according to the rhetoric he delivered them in their distress he led them by a straight path let them thank Yahweh for his faithfulness for his miracle wonderful works specifically he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry second case some were in prison and in uh, the ancient world just like the modern world you're only in prison if you're poor you didn't pay your debts so they were miserable in their chains they they didn't honor Psalm 1 that's what verse 11 is saying they rebelled against the word and spurned the counsel and they had hard labor and they fell down and there was no one to help them and then look at this they cried verse 13 and he saved them he brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds. Let them thank Yahweh for his reliability, for his miracles, for he broke down the doors of bronze and the bars of iron. These are all exoduses. Third case, they assumed that sickness has some connection to sin. Some were sick because of their iniquity. Hmm. And they lost their appetite. They damn near stared, starved to death. They cried. And he saved. They cried. He saved. So cry save, cry save, cry save. He healed them. He delivered them. Now this one is, has a slight variation. Let them thank Yahweh for his reliability, for his miracles. Now notice verse 22 is in advance. Let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices. Something of material value and let them tell his deeds so thanks is always utterance and material offering and the fourth case uh, some went down to ships in ships to sea and they saw the marvelous wonders of Yahweh who could stir up storms and waves and the storm mounted to heaven and went down to the depths and their courage melted away and they reeled and like, staggered like drunkards and they were at their wits end. You get that way in a storm. Now you know what's coming next. He cried, they cried, and he brought them out. He made the storm be still, he, and the waves were hushed and he brought them to a safe harbor let them thank Yahweh for his reliability, for his miracles. Let the whole congregation praise him. Now these are four case studies and you can add two or three or four, however more you'd like to add of your life or the lives of those you know who cried out and who were delivered to new orientation. So verse 22 is of particular importance for the point I'm trying to make is that in one of the four cases it's explicit about uh, a Thanksgiving sacrifice. The fullest form of this material gratitude is in Psalm 116 uh, and what, what, what happens in a song of Thanksgiving when you, when you tell somebody about what God has concretely, specifically done for you, for which we are thankful, you got to recite the story of the trouble you were in and the way you were wondrously delivered from the trouble. Uh, so they do that. This one starts out, Yahweh heard my voice and my supplication. He uh, inclined his ear. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of 
Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress. I cried and I said to Yahweh, Save my life! And then verses 5 through 7 are a little bit of a didactic reflection because people who have been saved want to instruct other people about how to make this work. So the Lord is merciful and return my soul and all that. Then verse 8, here's the thanksgiving. For you delivered my life from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I have kept faith even when I said I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, you can't trust any of those bookers. So how shall I give thanks? What shall I return to Yahweh for Yahweh's generosity? I will lift the cup of salvation. That's an interesting image to use for the Eucharist, isn't it? It's a cup of salvation that we drink in celebration of God's mighty deliverance of us from disorientation. I will pay my vows. I will offer to you thanksgiving sacrifice. I will pay my vows, says that twice, says it in verse 14 and then again in verse 18. In the presence of all of his people, I want the whole community to know that God hears and transforms in his body. So, so bringing visible material sacrifices is a way of testifying to the community that God's goodness and God's reliability really does have concrete transformative power. The utterance of thanksgiving is what Pentecostals call testimony. Presbyterians don't do that much. They're very private about God's gifts to us. But you know, Pentecostals have the habit of getting up and telling about the transformative power of God's mercy in their life. Psalm 50, I was saying to some people at lunch, this is a little digression, in Psalm 50, um, God says, verse 12, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, you don't, you don't have anything I need. So don't think you're bringing me offerings because I need your stuff. I don't need anything of yours. But this is wonderful. God says, uh, uh, I rebuke you even though you bring burnt offerings. And the, and the NRSV says, I will not accept even a bull you bring to sacrifice. I don't, I don't want that stuff. But what you need to know is that the RSV, not the NRSV, but the RSV translated that, I will accept no bull from your house. And a student, a student once gave me a rubber stamp of that verse on it that I used on term papers, I will accept <laughs> no bull from your house. <laughs> so, but, but the point that I want you to see is in verse 14, uh, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And then in verse 23, those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice honors me. So as uh, one of you said this morning about, uh, from a Calvinist perspective, the new life is a life of gratitude, and the life of gratitude needs to be liturgically articulated by generous offers of sacrifice. That's pretty consistent. And then uh, just for fun, I'll mention... Uh, um, Psalm 51 is a little curious. Uh, verse 16, this is that one about being a sinner. Verse 16 says, You have no delight in sacrifice. Even if I brought a burnt offering, you would not be pleased because what's acceptable is a, is a broken and contrite heart. But then scholars think that verses 18 and 19 are added <laughs> because verse uh, 16 says you will not delight in sacrifice, but then verse 19 says you will delight in right sacrifice in burnt offerings and bulls. So they uh, had some thoughts about that. So that's third one. Fourth one, then I'll be finished. Thanks. Thanks is always 
concrete and specific for particular newnesses that God gives. Unlike thanks, praise, praise just goes like that. It's open-ended, it's infinite, it's amorphous, it's grand. Praise is the exuberant abandonment of self in the goodness and the newness of God's mercy. I have a little taxonomy of praise hymns. This may be different in Canada, so this is a U.S. taxonomy. Baptists sing vigorously. Methodists sing really good. Presbyterians, you can't tell what verse they're on because they just barely mumble. And in the United States, Episcopalians pay people to sing for them. <laughs> the lesson to be learned is that the more stuff you got, the less you can open your hands like that. So it's related, to, I, I believe it's, doxology is related to economics because doxology is utter relinquishment. I have a colleague, my most blessed colleague, who's a confirmed Southern Presbyterian, and he told me one day they were in church and the youth led the service and, you know, young people will try anything. So they said, everybody go like that. And uh, Erskine said that his wife raised her hands like that. And it was the first time in 400 years that a clerk had had their hands above their ears in church. Like that. Here they go like that. So the book of Psalms culminates in praise. So look at 145. I will extol you my king and my God. You see the psalmist had heard of Movinkel, says king. Every day I will bless you and praise you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And, and, and then in verse uh, 10, all your works shall praise you and your glorious kingdom and your kingdom and blah, 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 blah. Psalm 46 is praise the Lord. You know that in Hebrew that's hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah myself. I will sing to Yahweh as long as I live. I will sing to my life, to God all my day, all my life long. And then it celebrates and in verse 10, Yahweh is king forever, hallelujah. And then Psalm 147, Hallelujah, praise Yah, because Yahweh is gracious and praise is fitting. Yahweh builds up, Yahweh scatters, gathers, Yahweh heals, Yahweh binds up, Yahweh determines, Yahweh lifts up. Verse 7, sing to Yahweh, make melody, Yahweh covers, Yahweh prepares, Yahweh makes, Yahweh gives. Yahweh delights, verse 12, praise Yahweh, praise your God, Yahweh strengthens, Yahweh blesses, Yahweh grants, Yahweh fills, Yahweh sends, Yahweh gives, Yahweh hurls, Yahweh sends, Yahweh makes, Yahweh declares, hallelujah, they just pile it up. Psalm 148, praise Yah, hallelujah. Hallelujah from the heavens in the heights. Praise Him, angels. Praise Him, host. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, stars. Praise Him, heavens. Praise Him, waters. Praise Him, because He did all this good stuff. Praise Him, you sea monsters. Praise Him, fire and hail and snow and frost and mountains and hills and fruit trees and cedar trees and wild animals and cattle and creeping things and birds. Praise Him, kings. Praise Him, princes. Praise Him, rulers. Praise Him, young men and women. Praise Him, old and young. Praise, 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 praise. 149, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Praise Yahweh, hallelujah, 149. Sing to Yahweh a new song. Praise. And then goes on through there. I want to get you to 150. 150 
is incredible because it's not about anything. It has no theme, no plot. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh with tambourines. Praise Him with triangles. Praise Him with drums. Praise Him with saxophone. Praise Him with clarinet. Praise Him with pipe organs. Praise Him with piano. Praise, 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 praise. It's a float off. So I like to think that Psalm 150 is like a love letter. I don't think you can send a love letter by email. You can have it. And when you get a love letter, love letters are not about anything. Love letters, I don't know whether people write love letters anymore, but when we used to write love letters, it was really an act of sending to the beloved, saying, here I am for you. And if you got a love letter, you turned it, and you read it, and you wanted to get it between the lines, you smelled it, you caressed it, because it's the presence of the beloved. I think that's how the Psalter finishes. Lost as the hymn says in wonder, love, and praise. And now we are a long, long distance from disorientation. Now what's going to happen if you do that, it's going to get encrusted and it'll all have to start again. But what I want you to observe, if you start out in Psalm 1 with obedience, quid pro quo, keep the Torah and prosper, and you end up in 150, it is an interesting question of our life. How do you get from obedience to exuberant self-abandonment. You get there by truth-telling in disorientation. And if you don't tell the truth about God in disorientation, you are likely to stay locked in obedience and never get to exuberant self-abandonment. So the big quarrels in the church now are between people who are locked into obedience and have not yet got to the self-abandonment of letting it all rest in God's hands. Now if you take these four points that I've outlined of the Great Enthronement Festival, the Pastoral Act of do not fear, gratitude as material offering, and praise as exuberant abandonment. What I want you to notice about all four of those is that they are boldly countercultural. The dominant culture does not believe that there can be a new regime of mercy. The dominant culture does not believe that there is a word that will overcome fear. The dominant culture does not believe you should offer generous sacrifices. You better hang on to what you got. And the dominant culture does not believe that you should abandon yourself in exuberance because if you do, somebody will take advantage of you. So every time the church meets and does these extraordinary psalms, it is engaging in subversive activity, saying that because God is God or because Jesus is Lord, the world is not the way our culture says it is. So two texts and then I'm done. I'll come back to... Luke 7, go tell John that the blind see and the lame walk and lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised and the poor rejoice. And then Jesus says, happy are you if you're not offended by that. Lucky are you if you're not scandalized. 
you're a lucky person if you're not upset by the news that newness can come in the world. And then in chapter 10, Luke, Jesus sends the disciples out and gives them power to cast out demons and it said they healed many people. So God, God's capacity for new orientation has been entrusted to Jesus and Jesus has entrusted to the church the enactment of new orientation. So it is the purpose of the church to enact and perform and testify that the rule of our risen Lord has defeated all the Friday chaos. And think what will happen when our society no longer is organized around fear. It is promised. So, we have time now to talk. Just by way of confirmation of what you've been saying, um, I remember when I was under a lot of stress as a young man that I asked myself a question that is, I've read since is suggested by many sources, and that is to ask yourself what the worst thing is that could happen to you. And I found as a result of looking at that that the worst thing that could happen to you wasn't dying, it was ending up out of favor with God, that is, going wherever, you, wherever God wasn't. And uh, at that point, and I guess I had had a fair amount of biblical background because I found myself saying, unto thee, O Lord, I commend my spirit. And right away it made you feel complete, me feel completely at, at peace, uh, something that has never really left. And, uh, and I, I'd like to just mention that as a way that if you can count, if you make it over that lump, you yep. really, it does make a huge difference. That's a powerful testimony. Thank you. There you go, sir. This curiosity came to me in between this morning and this afternoon, and, and what you've been talking about ending up in pure exuberant praise makes it even a bigger question or has come back to me. Liturgically, I'm an Episcopalian, and I find great richness in that. Uh, what was the last... I find great richness yeah. mm -hmm. and challenge in it. I'm very puzzled by some of the new age big mega churches liturgically or non-liturgically, which seems to be founded, what little I know of it, in only the praise. Can you speak to that or what? I think you already did. <laughs> that is, I think that... Uh, the seduction of those kind of churches, and some of them do honorable ministries, so I don't, but the ones we're talking about, they offer a package of certitude which is very attractive to deeply anxious people. And they give you the package and you go with it and my impression is you do not have to go deeply into the suffering of the world, but you kind of can float above the suffering of the world as though it didn't have anything to do with you. So in the United States, what these uh, kind of churches do is to, is to build a, what they call a whole life center so that you don't ever have to get outside of that 
to be in the presence of, uh, in our society, black people or poor people or anybody who's not like us. And I must say, it's wonderful, I guess, except that it isn't about anything. And it's certainly not about the gospel. We're talking about the same thing, aren't we? And if, if you never need to engage the suffering of the world, then I guess you can get by just singing endless praise hymns. The, the other thing about these terrible praise hymns is that they have no storyline. They, they don't tell any narrative about anything. And as you just did, sir, New, orient, new Orientation always evokes a narrative account of I was dead and now I'm alive, I was lost and now I am found. And if you don't have that narrative, then you don't have anything really to sing praise about. That's what I think. Thank you. Well, I think two things. I think it's been a long day, and I assume you are all in agreement with everything I've said. That's <laughs> all. I think you're talking about a video, right? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So yeah. That we can ponder it in all this wisdom. Yeah. And of course I took uh, one of my fellow students, uh, I think in reference to your material, chose the image of exile to describe the church today, that the church has gone into exile. Um, is that a, a disorientation or? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, and it, it may be very different in Canada, uh, but I believe in the United States um, that a faithful church is completely out of sync with the dominant culture and the dominant economic theory in the United States. Well, I've been living in the South in the Bible Belt, and uh, people say, uh, oh, no, no, no we're, the church isn't in exile in the South of the United States. We're still dominant. Except that if you try to say anything important about the economic crisis and the, the manufacturing of more and more poor neighbors, as soon as you talk about anything important in the faith, you are indeed in exile. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the hard thing in the church now is to come to terms with that because we have been in the United States, uh, the church has been a dominant institution and we want to still act that way but it doesn't square with social reality, at least not our kind of a church, because our kind of a church, the denominational leaders can't even get in to see the president anymore. Maybe, maybe they can with Obama, but they couldn't because they're not important enough. And you know the kind of company that George Bush kept among religious leaders and so on. So I, I think, I don't want to overstate it, uh, but I think exile is a useful metaphor for being a distinct sub-community with a subversive narrative about how society and the economics of society can be organized differently. So our hope isn't to, uh, to get back to Jerusalem and to have what we once lost. That's right. We don't want that, do we? Well, we may want it, but we're not going to get it. And in the Old Testament, I'm just making a shift in my own work, when you move from the Babylonian to the Persian period, what, what they had to work on was getting along with the Persians because when they got back to Jerusalem, it turned out that Jerusalem was Persian now. They controlled everything. So there's nowhere to go to go home to get away from that. So then you begin to get stories like uh, Esther and Daniel and, and in the book of Daniel, Daniel is a, is a very clever guy who negotiates with Nebuchadnezzar, who's the fictive thing, and, and he, he, he managed to, to keep his Jewishness, but he stays in touch with power. In the, I've just been studying that. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar has this nightmare about turning into an animal, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, uh, the Jew, 
Oh, what do you think I ought to do? And Daniel gives him a wonderful Jewish answer. He says, why don't you try mercy to the oppressed? Try that. <laughs> so uh, what happens is that the, the metaphor of exile and homecoming, I believe, gets changed to accommodation and resistance. And it requires great agility to know when to accommodate and when to resist. You, you, can't, you can't be in resistance all the time, and you better not be in accommodation all the time, so you have to do that, I think. And, and what's happening, you know, I've been teaching now for 50 years, uh, but, but, there's a, but there's a whole change in scholarship. 50 years ago, these later Persian period stuff from the Old Testament were not studied at all. We didn't know anything about it, we didn't pay any attention. We thought they were just all Jewish. And we studied Moses and all that good stuff. So it's very interesting that scholarship has gravitated to this later stuff that probably is more in sync with our cultural situation of faith in culture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, one, sir. I'm wrestling with the notion that uh, Christmas and Easter are liturgical performances which enact an intimate ceremony. Because in some ways it, it seems like Baal is one, that we're in a cultural, uh, agriculture ceremonials where, where we, um, through a sympathetic magic, enact the, the change of seasons. Whereas uh, there's a different reality in relation to time going on with God's own story, that God is subversive, we're not, we tend to try to keep God from being subversive and disorienting us. So, through God's own gracious activity, it breaks into our attempts to keep the uh, screws down on reorientation. And Easter and Christmas are in the liturgical performances, but in response to eschatological events. So that's... Um, there's, there's not something that we do at the heart of it, but something that we are to reorient our lives to in the midst of what God is yeah. doing for us. Well, I, don't, uh, I understand that argument about fertility original. You don't have to go down that road. It, it, it's, not, it's not necessary to say that we are enacting the seasons. We are enacting the birth and the resurrection of Jesus. And, well, that's what I said. And, and uh, I understand your theological point that God does it. And we don't, except the liturgy is not true. The, 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 anybody who had to direct a Christmas pageant knows that God will not direct the Christmas pageant. Somebody's got to get birth and do it. So, so where you and I would differ, I think, is, is whether uh, liturgical enactment does generate something new. And I understand old Protestant fear that you don't want to reenact sacrifice of Jesus in the Mass and all that. Uh, so we don't, we don't have a good word uh, for reformer because I didn't use the word repeat. That's the great boo. But what's clear in these heads is the birth and resurrection of Jesus are not just ancient memories. They are contemporary enactments. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I just, I, I want to follow, I will follow, nobody else has to, I want to follow Movis' hypothesis, because I think he's right that the, the liturgical performance is objective. And all you have to do is be a pastor who stands at back of church afterwards and fully experience it so. Now, you, you, you might want to wanna cut it thin and say, well, that's really bad theology. Uh, that's not how I think about it. Yeah, well, I think I, on a, on a thin point, do not agree. Um, I, don't, I don't know more about that. Uh, see, I, I, I will insist that the drama is real because I have opted for 
containing theology in dramatic categories, whereas most people would understand theology in ontological categories. And if you take the ontological categories, then the liturgy is just a show Oh, it's always really real. Yeah, I don't, I don't go there. I, I yep. said to you that there is a mutuality. Yep. Okay. All right. That's 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 close enough. As close as we're going to get. <laughs> Here, sir. Excuse me. We're, we have to get a train. You go. <laughs> it won't hold the train. <laughs> no, we're driving to get a train. Oh, okay. As we came across the bridge this morning. Um, we were greeted in a warm manner and made to feel welcome. As we leave go back across the river, we're going to have to defend who we are. That's the nature of these between our and your. But I want you to know, it's been a wonderful, warm feeling again to be back with you, Bob. And to be with you, Walter, I'll thank you for your message. Don't retire, please. <laughs> need to hear you speak. Thank you again for having us here.